Let us stand at this moment as we have the scripture reading, which is taken from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. You might have known it already, but we're going to read it together. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. When you have it, please say amen. Amen? And we read, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. We want to thank you for being with us through another week. Lord, as we have come to praise you, and your words are about to be opened, may we hear your voice saying, this is the way, walk therein. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me see. As children of God, there's a choice to be made on whom we will serve. And the choice is very clear. Choice, very clear. I want to begin the message, title of the message, The Religion of Self. I want to begin this message by reading a quote taken from the little book, Revive Us Again by Mark Finley. On page 13 and 14, and it's on the screen, and you can read along with me. It reads thus, and I quote, Prayer enable God in the context of the great controversy between good and evil to work more powerful than if we had not prayed. This conflict between Christ and Satan is a battle between the forces of hell and the forces of righteousness. The struggle is real. I repeat that. The struggle is real. Thousands upon thousands of angels are involved. The Bible Last book, Revelation, described the battle this way. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon and his angel, Revelation 12, 17. One third of the angel in heaven rebelled against God, Revelation 12, 4. These forces of evil bring disappointment, disease, Disaster and death to this world, the four Ds. The forces of righteousness bring joy, peace, health, and life. Each one of us also participate in this conflict. Ours is a planet of rebellion. I want us that to sink in a little bit. From that passage, there are at least five things, maybe more, uh, that came out. Five points. Number one. There is a battle going on between good and evil. 
Number two, there are leaders on both sides. Satan on one side, Christ on the other side. Number three, who are involved? Thousands of angels. And we are involved. What are the results? Mr. Roseanne, what are the results? The results are dis disappointment, disease, disaster, death, and on the other side, destruction, and on the other side, we have joy, peace, health, and life. The choice could not be more clear to you and I today. Talk about disappointment. You know, this week I was talking to a family and they're just a lot of disappointment coming on all fronts. From one thing to the next, disappointment. Talk about disease. We just heard about it, four-year-old having cancer. Talk about dementia. Talk about syphilis. Talk about heart disease. All of these. On the other hand, we have God is, who is seeking to give us good health, peace, joy, and life. The passage also tells us that prayer enables us, enable God to work on behalf of us more powerful. So God, through prayer, can work for us if we relate to him what is going on in our lives. So what that tells me is that the choice is clear. Each of us sitting here today are either on one side or the other. We are either in the, on the good side or we are on the evil side. And to whom we heal ourselves to that leader, be our leader, your father. Jesus, in John, and I invite you to turn there with me, John 8, chapter 8, verse 39 through 44, puts it another way. In a dis discussion with the Jews of that time, there was a discussion about Abraham as being the Jews' father and God being their father. And verse 39, they said, they answered and said to him, that is to Jesus, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would not, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We are, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. 
for I proceed forth and came from him. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to understand my words. And verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. The desire of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resource, for he is a liar and the father of it. So between the passage from Revive Us Again on John, we can gather this point. There is Satan, and then there is Jesus. And Satan could be your father, or Jesus could be your father. But, and the both of these leaders are desiring and reaching out for our worship. We know that whatever God does, the devil tried to copy him. So I want us now to look at the method used by each leader in attracting us to the worship, their worship. And we're going to start with the devil first. Please turn to, we know that the devil was where? Talk to me. Heaven. Okay. We know that the devil was in heaven. And he was cast out of heaven. Why was he cast out of heaven? Let us turn to Isaiah chapter 14, verse, reading verse 12 through 14. This passage would give us a very clear view of why he was cast out. Verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That was his name then. Son of the morning, how are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nation? The text is asking, how did you leave there? For you have said in your heart, I will do what? I will what? All right, and next, I will exalt. Above, I will do what? Yes, on the farthest side of the north, I will what? And what I will? So, the text tells us, in his heart was found iniquity. His desire was to be God, above God, he went on an I, I, and right from that moment, because he desired worship, he desired what Christ, he saw what Christ was getting, he wanted to have this worship. And from that moment, his desire was to supersede Christ. Now, I want us to listen to a quote from the servant of the Lord. 
regarding Lucifer. He says, and this is taken from Prophets, Patriots and Prophet, verse page 35. Little by little, Lucifer came to indulge in, desire, in the desire of self-exaltation. The scripture says, Thine art was lifted because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Ezekiel 28, 17. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will exalt my throne above the star. I will be like the most high. The verse that we just read. Though all is glory, Though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. Not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly host, he ventured to cover homage, to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme, in the affection and allegiance of all created being, it was in his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself and coveting the glory which the infinite father had invested his son. This prince of angels aspired a power that was the propagative of Christ alone. So here it is. He exalted himself. And he wanted to be like Christ. And right there, he started something. If I could only get individuals to be like me, be like me. To consider myself more important than it ought to be. If I could only do that. And watch what happened. Because we were told that he was cast out of heaven. Where did he go to? Earth. Look at what happened when he came to earth. Genesis chapter reading verse 1 through 6 it tells us now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said to the woman we know the story as God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it. It's now. Then, for, for God knows, no, then the serpent said to the, the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Did you see what he did? He appealed to our senses. See, each of us have this special thing about us. I, me, us. He appealed to her. You shall be like God. And what did she do? She ate the fruit. He began his religion by exalting himself 
he came down to this earth. And as he came down to this earth, he uses the same thing to deceive our first, first parents. Another example. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And we know the story about Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel. Reading from verse 31 through 32. Daniel chapter 2. We know that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he was concerned about the dream that he had. And he sent for all the astrologers and to come. And eventually Daniel came. And Daniel prayed to his God. And he was about to reveal the dream to, Nebuchadnezzar, to King Nebuchadnezzar. And in verse 31, Daniel says to the king, O you king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. 32. This image had what? A head that was fine gold and a chest of what? And his belly was what? And his legs was what? And his feet was what? A part clay. Okay. Jump over now from that verse to verse down to verse 36. Verse 36 to 38. This is a dream. Now we tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For God, the God of heaven, has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hands, and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Hmm. Got it, right? The head of gold. Let's go to chapter 3. And watch what, watch what happened. You see, when Daniel was telling the king about this dream, where do you think the evil one was? Right there. Talk to me. I, I want you to talk to me today. Right there. Watch, watch what happened here now in verse 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, made an image of gold. Whose height was? And its width was? And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Where is the, the bronze? Where, where is the clay? You see, that's what the devil used. And you only have to listen to us at most times. The servant of the Lord says, step to Christ. Our biggest problem is what? Self. Self. The church cannot move without me. I don't like this. I don't like that. It's all about me. And anytime we go down that road, you know what we're doing? We're joining Satan's religion. We're joining Satan's religion. He's the leader of it. He's the instigator of it. And he's seeking to get as much of us as he can.
He even tried to get Christ to think about himself. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12, at verse, chapter 4, verse 1 two, and 2. It tells us that Jesus had just fasted for what? 40 days. And he was led into the wilderness to be what? What do you think the devil came up with first? What, what, the, the, the verse, let's read the verse and hear what the verse says. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was what? And he goes on to say, when the tempter came, what did the tempter say? Tried to get Jesus to think of himself. But you know what? I serve a good God. I serve a good God who knew the tricks of the devil. We must be wise. You must be wise. Never self start to surface. Ask the Lord to take control. Ask the Lord to take control. So we have seen that the devil form is religious. Religion. And he's trying to get all of us into that religion. And if we can only get away from it, we know that that would be good. Now we want to look at Christ's method of bringing us into the true religion. What is Christ's religion? If we turn over so Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, reading verse says 3 and 4. This is what Christ is all about. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he has what? When did he chose us? Before the foundation of this world, that we should do what? And without what? In this? Oh my God. So here we find, even before this world was created, Christ was thinking of us. Christ is all about caring, not high. He came. He was thinking about us before he came. He came with us on, our, on his mind. And he's trying to, to help us to get this, this in our hearts, that we look out for each other. Let's look at another text. Romans 5 and verse 8. What does it say is there? Romans 5 and verse 8. God do what? Yes, in that while we were what? God. 
demonstrated his love towards you and I. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be right. Christ is about others. I came for you. John 17, verse, John chapter 17, verse 21, 20 and 21. John chapter 17, verse, verse 20 and 21. Let us read it. John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Jesus prayed for us. Are we praying for anybody? I hope so. We should. We should. If we are called children of God, we need to pray for each other. 20. I do not pray for these alone. That was the disciples and, they, and those around him at the time. But I also pray for those who will believe in me through their words. That they all may be what? As you, Father, are, are in me and I in you. That they may also be one where? That the world may do what? Believe that you sent me. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. The choice is clear. You have two leaders. One that brings appointment, disaster, disease, and death. One that gives you life, Gives you joy, gives you peace and health. Can't be much clearer than that. And if you look at what is happening in the world today, you will see the choice is clear. To go further, Jesus is thinking of us. That Jesus is thinking of us. What is Christ going to do? Oh my God. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, in my Father's house. If I were not so, I go. And if I go, I do what? That where you can't get it much clearer than that. Can't get it more clearer than that. Another quote from the servant of the Lord. There are those that is taking firm steps to Christ, and we are studying that book in prayer meeting now. I pray that. We would read it and come back and discuss it on a Wednesday evening. We are studying Step to Christ. So please take the, the Step to Christ you have in your home. Read it. If you have questions, mark it and come. Let us discuss what the Lord is saying to us. Servant of the Lord, Steps to Christ. Page 44. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own effort to obey his law and to form a right character and secure salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God's require of them in order to gain heaven. Did you get it? I'm going to read it again. I'm going to read it again. There are those who profess to serve God 
while relying upon their own effort to, to, to obey his law, to form a right character and secure salvation. He's saying, we profess to serve God. But you know what we're doing? We're relying on our own effort to obey God's law, to form the right character, and to secure salvation. Goes on. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duty of the Christian life as that which God require of them in order to gain heaven. Such religion is worth such religion is worth nothing. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with love, with the joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him. And in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. Love to Christ will be the spring of action. Those who feel the constraint, constraining love of God do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements of God. They do not ask for the lowest standard, but aim at the perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. With earnest desire, they hear all and manifest an interest in proportionate to the value of the object which they seek. A profession of Christ without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality, and heavy degree. So, Brother Mel, have to examine himself. I'm not speaking for anybody. I'm preaching to myself today. You see, I have come to the realization I'm going to die. Where in this world, this world is destined for fire. The only way you and I can get off this world is through reality. Now, I could actually take that and say, okay, I'm going to try like, like what she said here. But when you look at what Christ has done for you and I, when you look at what Christ has done for you and I. The extent to which he has gone to try to save you and I. The love that he has shown to you and I. I couldn't help but give my life to him. Couldn't help. You talk about wanting love, Christ has it. You talk about wanting peace, he can give it. You talk about health, and this is something that I'm really looking at now. You see, part of the reason why we tend to be not so healthy is because I like this. This tastes good to me. You know? No. God has given us ways to help us to be healthy. You want life? You can get it. You can get it. So yes. So imagine this. Christ loved us came from heaven to die for us while we were thinking of killing him, but he still came and died for us so that we could have a chance at hope. And he now says to you and I today, love one another. Because when we give our life to Jesus, 
we now become what? We become what? Ambassadors, right? Our representative for him. And he's saying, follow the examples that I have set for you. What examples has he set for you? He said, love those who don't love you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Because I have done it. Feed those who hate you. So imagine each of us, according to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, bearing each other's burden. Imagine us bearing each other's burden. Someone sick. We respond. Someone need help. We respond. Someone need prayer. We respond. Hmm. You see, this morning when I came in, they had mission and story going on. What happened from us Adventists? Responding to that lady. Anybody remember? What happened? A whole church. She wasn't even an Adventist. But we, we, we get someone to they get someone to go wash for her. And they wash, then they cook. Did all of that for her. Next thing you know. She got baptized, and she told someone else, and she told another person, and she told her relative. Next thing you know, whole church, just from us, put himself aside and reaching out. My final text. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Reading verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, reading verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in loneliness of mind, let each other esteem, let each esteem others better than. So can you imagine? If I should come here and I'm esteeming Brother Hannah better than myself. And Brother Hannah is esteeming me better than himself. And we're all esteeming each other. Better than, what would happen? What, what would happen? This church would grow. We'd be looking out for each other. Let me not think of my home. Let us think about each other. I am thinking about Brother Hannah. I'm thinking about my brother. I will reach out. But that is what God wants. That is what God wants of us. That is exactly what he wants of us. Let each esteem others better than himself. In order for us To gain this victory, something must happen. I said I was going to give you last text, but I'm, I'm, I'm adding one more. Colossians 3, chapter 3, verse 3. 
As a matter of fact, I'll go from two. Verse two and three. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. For you do what? For you what? I didn't hear everybody. And what? God for us gain this victory where the male has to die. Where the male has to die. Part of the problem that we end up in so much going on, our self is still alive. We only talked about it. Very good talkers. As servant of the Lord said, only talk. But we have to kill self. Anytime self dies, I say the Kendall Church will be a better place. All churches will be a better place. Because when self die, who get the worship? Thank you very much. I pray that these words may fill our hearts.